Hello and welcome to another episode of Vienna Arbitration Talks. Vienna Arbitration Talks is a series of interviews that we do here at Connard Partners, where we invite prominent arbitration practitioners to Vienna and discuss with them exciting topics in international arbitration. So today I'm very happy to host no other than Michael Schneider, who is joining us straight from Geneva. Hi, Michael. Welcome to Vienna. Uh, thank you, Peter. First of all, congratulations to you and to Christian Conrad for this uh, initiative, which I think is a great initiative to uh, focus the international city of Vienna and international arbitration in Vienna and the broad reach of you and your firm. Thank you very much, Michael, for your kind words. It's uh, always a pleasure to see you here in Vienna and uh, thank you for coming to the show. Uh, view, dear viewers, as you probably know, Michael is a partner at La Live in Geneva. In fact, he is one of the four founding partners. Michael has served as arbitrator and counsel in some of the most prominent uh, arbitration cases out there. His peers have even described him as uh, the legend of international arbitration. Uh, Michael was uh, the president of the Swiss Arbitration Association, the ASA. Uh, the uh, International Academy of Construction Lawyers and the Vice Chair of the ICC Commission on Arbitration. Uh, also, as a um, few of our previous guests, Michael is also a delegate uh, at the Ancitral Sessions. Uh, in fact, I met Michael many years ago when I was a young intern there. Uh, Michael at that time chaired Working Group 2 when it was revising the uh, ancestral arbitration rules and uh, later also during the revision of the notes on organizing uh, of uh, arbitral proceedings and uh, Michael was also vice chair of the Working Group. So um, Michael, you are representing Switzerland at Working Group 2 uh, which is currently dealing with expedited proceedings. Can you tell us what is going on in the sessions right now? Well, I first want to emphasize the experience of working with UNCITRAL, uh, which is a commission with the 60 members and uh, a number of other observer states. And UNCITRAL is working on consensus, uh, which means the discussions are of a group of people with very diverse backgrounds, with uh, diverse views of arbitration, and uh, within the objective of finding a joint solution. And that is a great experience. It's a great experience uh, to chair the work, but it's also a great experience to uh, participate in the debate. And what we're discussing now is accelerated arbitration, which is very much uh, in fashion. Com your users complain uh, about the, uh, the slowness of arbitration and, of course, the costs, but especially uh, problems of time. The problems come from the arbitrators, the time they take in making their award, but also the way, the duration of the arbitration. And therefore, UNCITRAL decided to address this particular aspect. There, the question is, on the one hand, you want to accelerate the proceedings, and in some cases that is easy, where the, the dispute and the industry and the players are all of the same background, uh, then it is relatively easy for the tribunal to understand uh, what is going on and what separates the parties. But in international, organizer, in international arbitration, uh, it is often a difference between cultures, between industries, and the uh, main problem or the main challenge in international arbitration is the communication. First, the communication between the party and their lawyers, especially if they're not the normal lawyers of the company but specialized in arbitration, and then from the lawyers to the tribunal. So uh, the, the process is a question of understanding first the lawyers understanding what their parties have and then the tribunal understanding what the two parties have understood or what their pre preoccupations are. You have mentioned uh, differences between cultures and industries and the resulting differences uh, in communication between different actors in arbitration as one of the main challenges of international arbitration. Uh, this fits quite well into our main topic for today. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about interactive arbitrators. I have read your book chapter published at the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the Queen Mary School of International Arbitration uh, and the title was The Uncertain Future of Interactive Arbitrator. 
uh, in this chapter you speak on one hand of the hands-off arbitrator, whom you call the impartial referee, and on the other hand, the hands-on arbitrator, whom you call the dispute solver. Uh, so if I may cite you, you said, it would seem that arbitrators have moved away from the role uh, model of the dispute solver, and despite many proposals to the contrary, increasingly adopt that of the impartial referee. Uh, then you go on to say, I hope that I am wrong, we will see. So four years down the road, you have seen the future, if I may say so. Uh, can you tell us, do we see more hands-on arbitrator these days? First of all, any perception of what's going on in arbitration is partial because much of the proceedings are, are confidential. Uh, you hear uh, in discussions, you hear from your own cases, from your colleagues. So what I'm saying necessarily is in uh, uh, a picture, only an excerpt of the picture. But I, I first want to clarify, this is not a question of uh, evol evolution. It is a basic cultural difference. In the common law world, the judge and the arbitrator is an impartial referee. He or she see to it that the game is played fairly and correctly according to the rules, and then he or she decides. And for an arbitrator to step in, like we are used in, in Austria, but also in, in the Germanic tradition or in Switzerland, an arbitrator stepping in to uh, the debate and uh, communicating with the parties, discussing the case with the parties, is anathema. I uh, may add an a anecdote which I had some years ago, where after the first round of pleadings and before the hearing, I got the parties and their lawyers together and said, I've read your submissions. I have a certain understanding of the case. I want to tell you what I have understood and where to tell you where I see the problem so that we can focus the hearing on the issues which will be necessary for me to decide. Uh, and I said, normally I would do this without asking, but since you are from England, I ask you first, uh, is that agreeable to you? And one side said, they were both international but English background uh, solicitor firms. They both said, the one side said, no problem. The other said, no, you can't do this. Uh, and we started discussing. When the case was over, I heard from one of the sides, they had a QC with them, who went to the other side and said, you have to stop this crazy arbitrator. Uh, because for, in their perspective, this was something uh, that shows a risk of partiality or prejudgment. And uh, it is only in the discussion uh, that we finally came to a common procedure. So I think one important thing is you, you should not impose uh, your way of handling it. But uh, in my approach, in my way of dealing uh, with the cases, I am very uh, interactive in this respect. So when the tribunal is applying such a hands-on approach, do you think that counsel from jurisdictions with a more hands-off approach uh, would get worried that they're losing control over their case? So for example, if the tribunal says that it does not consider certain evidence relevant. Uh, what do you think about this? That is exactly the point. I, uh, while I was president of ASA, I had every uh, three months to write the a, uh, introductory note to the bulletin, uh, and uh, one of the notes was on the transfer of ownership. The parties, when they start, it's their case. And in fact, there are two cases. Uh, each party has its case, but at the end, when he or she have to write the award, it must be the arbitrator's case. So the question is, when and how is the case transferred? The transfer of ownership of the case, and there is the one model, you do that, the proceedings are controlled by the parties, and at the end, the, when the hearing is over and the tribunal deliberates, the case is transferred. I more, uh, am more inclined to what I call the interactive or the transparent process so that you know how the case evolves, in particular what the arbitrator has understood. And I, from my perspective, it is better to understand or to see if the arbitrator hasn't understood your case and what he has not understood at a time when you can still correct it uh, and not at the time uh, when you read the award when it is too late.
I assume that for employing this uh, hands-on approach, arbitrators must be prepared and uh, read the case file from the very beginning onwards. Uh, but uh, as we know, that does not always happen. Uh, if we look at the ICC, they have included a requirement uh, to include into the terms of reference a summary of the parties' respective claims, as well as a list of issues to be determined. Uh, I guess this way the tribunal would look at the issues from the very beginning and uh, discuss them with the parties. Uh, but we often see that these are um, left blank for the parties to fill in. That's, uh, in fact, the problem. The, the idea of the ICC of having the terms of reference, which have been criticized, but which they find are a very useful uh, tool, not only for the various practical points, notification, etc., uh, but also for focusing the dispute, where the party's uh, case is described and then the issues are uh, uh, flagged. Now, the very frequent practice is that rather than the arbitrator transcribing or summarizing what he or she have understood from the case and putting this in the, uh, in the terms of reference, the arbitrators invite each party uh, to make its uh, summary, which I think uh, makes you lose a first step of getting engaged in the arbitration. Uh, or in the case, and then the definition of issues is a problematic point because the issues evolve. So uh, I think it's useful to try that, but perhaps it's better not to do this in the terms of reference because they are an agreement between the parties and the tribunal. Uh, so normally I do this separately so that I can adapt them uh, as the case evolves. When you sit as arbitrator, do you ask parties to prepare a list of issues that uh, they agree on? Ah, <laughs> I, uh, when I started, I thought it's uh, important to get as many, case, many agreed facts as possible. Until I realized that I had agree in one case I had agreement on facts, which was wrong. Because the, arbit the council agreed to the facts, uh, it was a certain date of completion. Uh, but they didn't know enough of the case yet, because often, as counsel, you come in at a very early, especially at the respondent side, and we agreed on a, on a fact which turned out to be wrong. Uh, so I'm now more careful uh, about this. <laughs> but one thing I do, I sometimes uh, say I have understood this element, um, or make after the first round of pleadings, either with the parties or in writing, uh, say where I see uh, the problems, what I have understood, and then see uh, these are the controversies. Uh. So you would then pose additional questions oh, yes. to oh, the yes. parties uh, so that they know what you are thinking. Yeah. And as counsel, uh, because I, a large part of my practice is still counsel, which I think is very exciting, uh, keeps you on your toes. Uh, and as counsel, I tell the tribunal, I want this, and I meet with great reluctance. Uh, tribunals uh, say, no, we don't want to show prejudgment or other excuses. Sometimes it's honest, sometimes it's just an excuse that they don't want to uh, get too early involved. But as you say, reading, uh, reading uh, the submissions, it's, uh, there are two possible approaches. Either you say, I read the submission as soon as it comes in, so I know how it is evolving. On the other hand, you read something and you say, what does the other side say to this? Mm -hmm. So uh, it is often very instructive to read the two submissions in parallel. Uh, these are different approaches and I think one is as good as the other. We spoke before about cultural differences in communication with the parties and uh, in the book chapter I mentioned before, you talk about the Relationstechnik, a concept known from German courts. Uh, could you tell us more about the Relationstechnik and uh, can we apply any of its elements in arbitration? Well, the Relationstechnik is a typical German development. I think to some extent it is applied also in Austria and in Switzerland. In Switzerland we have a cultural difference because between the Francophone and the Germanic, uh, German speaking group. It's now more harmonized because there is a central uh, a, a federal code of civil procedure, but you had these different approaches. 
In uh, Zurich, uh, it was very developed, uh, where you had the referendum audience, where uh, the uh, reporting judge sat with the parties and told them what he was going to decide. Um, the relation technique is, a, is more practical, where uh, the, the judge or the arbitrator uh, looks at the claim and determines whether the claim is conclusive, schlüssig. Uh, and uh, only if it is schlüssig does it make sense to uh, require a, a response and if it's not schlüssig you can dismiss it and uh, that determines also uh, the evidence you're, you're requiring what is then contested. I don't think we have time to go into the detail and in this formal uh, uh, approach I think it is difficult to apply in arbitration uh, but basically uh, some elements of it I think are useful that uh, you really look what is contested before uh, you go into a hearing so that you really know uh, you're not wasting time uh, on testimony uh, and discussing cases on issues that are not contested and therefore the joint hearing of experts and witnesses, uh, uh, joint hearing or collective hearing the, the Australians have uh, invent, reinvented this practice uh, and call it uh, hot tubbing, a, a term that has become generally used, which I find a horrible term, uh, because if you picture some of these experts in a hot tub. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, expressing preliminary views? This can help parties identify the issues that the tribunal finds relevant and uh, then focus the arbitration on those particular issues. Uh, what do you think about this? Given the difference in culture, I don't go very far in this. Uh, I often present it in the form of uh, picking up what the other side says and saying your opponent is uh, having this point, what do you respond to this? Uh, I think it can be done. Uh, I've had cases as, as counsel where uh, the arbitrator gave a very advanced term or advanced explanations uh, which we found useful even in the negative parts because we knew where the problems were and uh, we had then the opportunity at the hearing and had further argument. Uh, so it has its advantages uh, but because of the different sensitivities I think you have to do it with, uh, with caution. I have one last question for you Michael. You've been described by Global Arbitration Review as a very effective leader in hearings. Uh, do you have any tips for our viewers how to conduct a hearing? Well I have learned a, a lot of things from the Laliv brothers, the founders of uh, our firm, from my partners, but I also learned a lot from Professor Anna Hirsch, uh, before whom I appeared in my first uh, case where I was lead counsel and uh, I started uh, cross-examination and, and then he said, Mr. Schneider, if you continue like this, we better stop this. And uh, he, did, uh, he did the question. I have to say, at that time, I wasn't very effective in cross-examining, which, uh, by the way, uh, I don't think it is a very useful practice, but it's, for counsel, a very exciting uh, practice because you have, you're trying to establish a relationship with a person who distrusts you and uh, you uh, uh, want to get him to tell you things which he doesn't want to say uh, and then it gets really interesting when you feel the, uh, the tribunal is interested in what you're doing then it's like you're on stage uh, by the way I saw the new version of Faust uh, last night uh, I think we'll, uh, that will be another interview uh, but uh, this experience of the stage as counsel uh, in cross-examination in this relationship before a tribunal is quite a, uh, an exciting uh, aspect. Now, uh, the question uh, you had, uh, I learned from Professor Hirsch of getting the experts and the witnesses together uh, and questioning uh, them together. Uh, you get an, uh, often an amazing amount of consensus uh, and you can identify where the differences are. At the end of the hearing or on a certain subject, I say we have uh, now understood that the witnesses agree on these points and they agree on this point. So I invite counsel afterwards in the post-hearing submission to tell us uh, whom uh, of the witnesses we should be believe on this point. 
So uh, that's a way uh, which is surprising for uh, many counsel and uh, I have to do some explanation before and in fact it is important to explain that before you shouldn't take uh, counsel by surprise. It uh, maybe makes it more efficient I guess. It does yes it might make it much much shorter and also because the, the witnesses are more relaxed and more willing to tell you as a tribunal uh, rather than to opposite counsel where they are told he's your enemy uh, so, uh, it, it, from that point of view also it's more effective. Thank you very much, Michael, for this exciting discussion. It's always a pleasure to see you here in Vienna. Uh, I hope we can talk again soon to see how the hands-on arbitrator or the dispute solver is doing in the future. Dear viewers, this was all for today. Thanks for watching us. Uh, don't miss our next episode when we are hosting another prominent arbitration practitioner. Uh, until then, thank you and greetings from Vienna.